Um, last week you were having a look at radioactive decay and specifically radioactive half-life and the plan for this week is to kind of take that to the next level and make it much more of an A-level physics type of content and do some of the math behind it. So this is our classic kind of rate graph. So we've got the number of radioactive particles on our y-axis and time across the x and I've got 100% of my sample here at the start. Now kind of our definition of half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of these radioactive particles to decay. So after one half-life, half of them decayed, so I'm down to 50%. Now, in reality, in a kind of radioactive sample, I might have had 100% of radioactive uranium here. And after a half-life, it's decayed into, well, half of it's decayed into something else and half of it's left of uranium. So, you know, box of particles, they won't be able to necessarily see a difference, but in terms of the number of uranium nuclei, they've gone down by half. After another half-life, they've gone down again, and after another half-life, they've gone down again. So what we get is this lovely exponential curve. And what we mean by an exponential curve is it's following this mathematical exponential function, y is equal to e to the power of x where E is the natural number, 2.71, and so on and so on, the number that goes on forever, just like pi does. Um, and why this is a really interesting number and a really interesting function um, in physics is, is it seems to underpin a lot of what happens in the universe, actually. Um, and why we like it is the gradient of this graph is the same as the y value at every point in this graph. And that lets us do some really interesting things in terms of the mathematics. Um, so what you were able to do based on your GCC knowledge was if we've got 25% of the sample after a certain amount of time, well, you know that's been one, two half-lives. And so you can work out the number of particles or how long it's been around for. What we need to be able to do as a physicist, though, is sit there and go, well, when I've got 74.66% of what I started with, well, what's the number going to be then? How long has that taken? And actually do some of it mathematically. So Let's talk about radioactive decay as a thing. <clears throat> Strangely for radioactive decay, is, is there's two sides to it. One is a completely random process. If you have a particular atom, a particular radioactive isotope, you cannot tell when that one will decay. However, it is what we call a predictable process. It's predictable, as in there's a certain probability of something happening. And it's a bit like, say, rolling a dice. If I roll a particular dice, I can't tell you for certain when it's going to land on a six. However, if I rolled a million dice, I could be really, really accurate in terms of the percentage of them or the number of them that were going to turn up as sixes. So here is a box, and inside it is a radioactive source. And this thing here is my GM tube a Geiger Muller tube, and what it's going to do is detect a certain number of radioactive particles that are emitted by these radioactive isotopes. So our alpha, our beta, or our gamma that's leaving will hit our GM tube. And what this is going to be able to measure is not the number of particles in this box, because that's a really difficult thing to do, we can't count them, but it's going to measure the activity. It's going to measure the number of decays per second. And that's something we give the units of Becquerel's to. Um, our activity is going to depend on two things. It's going to depend on the number of particles inside that box. And it's also going to depend on the probability of a decay. We refer to that as the decay constant. And if I've got a higher chance of a particular atom decaying, I'm going to get more given out every second, I'm going to have a higher activity. If I've got more particles inside that box, more of them are going to decay every second, so I'm going to have a higher activity. Now, we can do some maths associated with So our activity is equal to minus lambda n. We talk about it as decreasing over time, that's why the minus sign's there, but it's our probability, decay constant, times by the number of particles we have inside that box. Now, 
as in other physicists, we don't need to be talking about differential equations. That's something that we leave very much for A-level maths. But in terms of physics generally and doing it at degree level, it is something that's really, really important. So our activity is also equal to the rate of change of the number of nuclear dm by dt. Now, we, we, we could do the kind of bigger delta m by delta t, how they're changing over time. And that, that is definitely true. And we can kind of play that game with physicists. But actually, this dm by dt, is equal to minus lambda n. That's a differential equation. We can solve that differential equation. We can say that the number of particles at a particular moment in time would be the number n0 there were at the start, e to the power of minus lambda t. That is the second equation we need to know. And the big thing is n is equal to n0 at t is equal to zero seconds. So with these two equations, we can start doing things like, well, if I've got a certain activity and I know the decay constant of this particular element, I can work out the number of particles that are there. If I know how many particles there are at the start and I know how long the experiments are running for and I know the decay constant, I can work out what n is or different combinations thereof. So we're no longer limited to where we were over in our graph of just doing it half and half and half and half. We can work it out for any point in time. The other thing that's really important for us is to be able to work out the half-life from the decay constant. So a little derivation, not so that you necessarily need to know, but it's a useful thing to see so you can sort of see where the results come from. So at the point where my time is equal to my half-life, well, my number of particles is going to be whatever was there at the start, n naught, divided by 2. Half the number of particles after the half-life. So let's just put that into my equation n is n0 over 2, n0 e to the minus lambda t a half. A half is equal to e to the minus lambda t a half. Now, in the same way that division is the opposite of multiplication, the opposite function for the exponential function here is what we call logarithms. Now, that's not something that we spent a lot of time talking about, but it's something we will look at. So log of a half is equal to minus lambda t a half, the half-life. One of the joys of logs, now a wonderful thing to play about with mathematically, is, is there's lots of rules about things. So rather than writing log of a half, I can write minus log 2. So this then becomes log 2 is equal to lambda t a half. So if you want to work out the half-life, it's log 2 over lambda. So <coughs> What this lets you do in a question, and, and this is something that comes actually right at the end of the A-level course, it's kind of like our math skills are really, really good. If they were to give you the half-life of a particular sample, we could work out the decay constant. If you know the decay constant and you know the activity, you could work out the number of particles in that sample. Or we could see how these things are going through, but we've got lots of different equations that we can link together. And this is the kind of skill that we need to start developing, how we can use all of these different bits of information in the right way. And that's what the questions this week are going to focus on. Thank you.